Look, I'll tell you this. If the game is on Wednesday night and it is going to overlap it all with trivia, it's going to be an incredible game or it's going to overtime. Yeah. What time did you all? Well, let's see. That game ended. Well, you all started trivia about 830, didn't you? Yep. Started about 830. Well, look, I mean, Clayton gets shot there at the end. If that thing goes in, we're going to double overtime. <laughs> I know. And it's no telling how long we're there. Um, That's a heck of a game, though, man. Yeah. Look, I, I know we're going to take a deep dive into this game, especially this first segment, but I'm looking at a – Steel shot of Nate Oates. Uh, people love my Mucinex jacket. I say that facetiously. Uh-huh. He had a little bit of the lime going on. I didn't know what color his oh, jacket was. It's very Dwight Schrute. So you see lime in that? Oh, I see like a golden lime maze. Mustard. It's mustard. Yeah. Now, he said it was mustard after the game. Somebody asked him. Uh, He's in the Hall of Fame, right? It does. It does without the uh, without the plaid, it would be the NFL Hall of Fame jacket. I do not like that color. I think Dwight Schrute, I think they put him in mustard because it was such a bad look and it showed you. I think Nate's got pretty good style typically. So a buddy of mine, like early in the game that knew I was there, texted me and said, is that a yellow jacket from, uh, from Nate Oates? And I said, you know, in person, I would call it mustard. Yeah, I think if it didn't have it a plaid pattern on it, I think it would be easily called mustard. Yeah. I think the blue makes it pop a little bit more to bring out a different kind of yellow, if that makes any okay. sense at all. Uh-huh. But outside of the wardrobe... Well, I was going to say. There's got to be some responsibility on Nate Oates. The shot selection well, hang on, hang on, in overtime no, was awful. All right. So before we get away from the jacket, though, he was asked about it at the uh, end of his press conference. One of the reporters said, so a mustard jacket tonight, huh? And he laughed. He goes, my daughter hates it. Okay. So his daughter hates it. So yeah. his daughter is on the record as hating one well, of his I would tell, I love the fact that Nate will wear something, although people hate it. Uh, yeah, you do that with the Mucin X jacket. Yeah, you look, I mean, I, 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 I own my style, whether you like it or not. It's it's what I like. He yeah. their own, right? Yep. Um, but Nate kind of rocked that last night. Biggest problem I had with Nate last night. Shot hey, selection. Well, I thought the shot selection. I don't know how you felt. They open up 7-0 in overtime, and they are just chunking with 15, 20 seconds on the shot clock. And you got to play possessions when you've got a five-minute period where you're lucky enough to survive and extend this game. And from a personal standpoint, you know, having Florida plus the eight and a half to ten, it went off at wherever I you notice that. Yeah. Whenever you put that number in, we had it at Lance'sLog.com last night. So I was nervous. This game was really getting away from Florida, and Alabama was absolutely trying to bury them. But there is something when you get a two-possession lead. You've got to play some clock. Yeah, you, I think normally you do. I don't disagree with that. Being in the building, and I don't know how this came across on television, um, but being in the building, Florida felt cooked at that moment. And I felt like they were trying to – they felt like they had Florida, you know, against the, against the ropes and they were trying to end them. And that might not have been the best strategy. I'm just telling you that was the feeling I got. Florida well, looked cooked. I, I will tell you this. If Clayton makes that three – this game goes to double overtime, and Florida finds a way to win. Nate Oates is getting destroyed. And I'm not talking about just from a national perspective. I'm talking about our Alabama fans are going to be like, what in the hell has happened? That could be the moment that Alabama nosedives. A team that, what, now is 27-1 and over the last two years in Coleman? Yeah. You know, to be able to come back down 10. And I told Rocky, I yelled at him. He was getting things ready on stage. I said, this game's going to overtime. Just could, could feel it. Yeah, five minutes left, and I was like, "Yeah, I, I just all I do is sigh." Like, yeah. <laughs> Here it goes. But for them to be able to take that game to overtime and then jump out, I just thought they should have played the possessions better. It ultimately works out. Alabama gets a five point win, a uh, big win. I see Florida's on the bubble now. I don't understand that. On the bubble, they're yeah. in the top thirty in the net. Uh, now they're on the bubble. I, 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 That's a good I, team. I, yeah, I mean, if you start to look at some of this, some some people have Florida on the bubble, which makes no sense. I yeah. agree, inside outside playing their best basketball right now, right now, almost stole one last night. And from where Florida was in December to where they are right now, it's a completely different team. Todd Golden's done a really good job with it. That is one of those they will look back, though, when it comes to seeding, because I'm with you, they ultimately get in, I believe. But when it comes to seeding, they'll be like, damn, that's one we should have had.
And now they got to go back to Gainesville. It's going to be a tough spot for them. I think it's a good Florida team. I'm surprised people have them on the bubble. Yeah. That looked like a tournament team. No, I heard somebody talking about them this morning. It was uh, one of these national um, bracketology guys. Yeah. He said he was surprised too, but – you know, he saw somewhere on ESPN, maybe it's Lenardi, I don't know. I'll try to find Lenardi. But they had Florida just getting in the field. I mean, they walked Auburn off the court. Yeah, I know. In he, he pointed that out, too. They, I mean, they, they go to Tuscaloosa and do everything but beat Alabama. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, this Florida team is good. The SEC is obviously really good. I think Florida should be squarely in right now. But again, if you're Todd Golden, that is one of those signature wins on the road, which are so difficult to get this year that you feel like you just let it slip through your fingers. Uh, here is Nate Oates in hey, By the way, did anybody jacket. ask him about the uh, possessions in, in overtime? Uh, don't, rem- don't think they did. I think that's a... Uh, Fan-friendly media. That is something that's got you extremely fired up today that I don't know that I, a whole I, lot of I, people noticed. I, I can't believe people didn't notice that. Well, I think a lot of times you're watching it through a lens of point spread and other people are watching it through a lens of scoreboard. No, I would be watching it through a lens of how are we going to shorten this game and get out of here now that yeah. we've got a seven-point lead. Yeah, no, nobody asked him about that. Uh, in fact, you're really the first person I've heard bring it up. This is throwing the football when the other team has timeouts. <laughs> here is Nate Or Oates. doesn't have timeouts. Doesn't have take timeouts. Out. Yeah, yeah, giving them timeouts. Here is Nate Oates. Nate Oates in the mustard jacket in the postgame after Alabama's win. We're figuring out ways to win. If you're going to win a league championship, which we're obviously in the hunt for now with five games left, these are the games that you got to figure out ways to win even when you don't play well. I mean, we were two for 18 from three at the half, and we were within striking distance. And I, I told them at half, guys, like we've been through this formula before. When we're not making threes, you can still win the game. So what you got to do is go kill them on the old glass, we ended up with 21 old boards. You got to get yourself to the free throw line. We outscored them at the free throw line. You got to take care of the ball and turn them over. But for us to outscore them 56 40 in the paint, like our guys have the wherewithal, you know, we obviously like to make a lot of threes around here. We've, I think we made 18 back to back games going into this. It wasn't dropping. We figured out a way to score 56 points in the paint. So I give our guys a lot of credit. They figured out a way to win a game. Uh, Rick says, I'm with LT. I was screaming, run the clock. Um, well, I mean, Andrew it, it, says, I noticed they built a lead in overtime, ultimately won, not by shooting threes and missing one of their starters. Um, I mean, right sell out. We've talked about what yeah. a factor he has become. So, look, that was a big omission uh, from this lineup last night. Yeah, Rusty says, they don't shy away from shooting it. They pay no attention to the clock. And that is the thing. Their offense is not. It, it has nothing to do with the shot clock. Shot clock may as well not even be functioning for Alabama's offense. I get that in regular situations, but this is almost, uh, you tell me the fastest offense right now in college. Well, let's just go with Josh Heupel two years ago. Okay. And they are, let's, let's, let's get it. Uh, let's go as fast as we can. It's all about tempo. But if you're inside of two minutes and you've got a lead, You've got to be able to take the air out of the football. You've got to be able to do that. And it is what complicates an offense like Josh Heupel's. There are offenses, say, for instance, Georgia. Georgia is far more conditioned to do that, right? That's more their offense. But when you're running an offense like a Lane Kiffin does or like a Josh Heupel does, it gets tricky. Yeah, but you Because it is completely the opposite of what you do Every single game you play. But in game situations, you work on this. Okay. You do, we're you up, do but we're, I'm just saying we're it, up seven with two minutes I to go. It. We've got basically four guards on the court. We've got the ability to handle this basketball and take a full thirty seconds off the clock, and they weren't yep. doing it. Yep. Look, but, again, they said they escaped. They did. But I'm just saying you get yourself in an uncomfortable situation doing things you never do. You've still got to score points in overtime. You can't just, I mean, seven, they jumped out 7-0. Did you think seven points was going to be enough to win that overtime? So uh, they've, they've still got to score points. Well, I thought with two and a half minutes left when Florida, before Florida scored their first points, yeah. I thought a 7-0 lead, yeah. I mean, they're going to have to foul at some point. Alabama's really good at shooting free throws yeah. now. But they did win the game. No, I, 
again, I said this would be so different. Well, I know. Do you know how many threes they missed in the final two and well, a half minutes? They were eight of 32 from beyond yeah. the arc. The fact that they could score in the 90s and be eight of 32 is incredible. Again, why you're shooting these threes, though? One, That's their two, offense. three. But you've got to be able to change in situations. If what what are they football, supposed to do? You would be talking totally different about the, at least take the clock down. If you want to take that three with no time on the shot clock, I get it. Well, then you get a bad ta- three. But when you're taking it with t- – but still, you're still taking the clock down where well, Florida doesn't have an opportunity to win the game. And you don't score points. I mean, that's my point is in that offense, when you get an open shot, you take it. I mean, what, what else are they supposed to do? They're just supposed to completely change their offense, start taking a bunch of mid-range jumpers? You could change your offenses in football. Uh, well, this is basketball, though. This yeah, is, but this you've got to be offense. able to run clock. I know, yeah. but in football, it's their well, I'm offense. I'm just saying, but... if they run clock, they're probably going to get a crap shot. Okay. So they're not going to get points. In retrospect, if this would have bitten them in the ass. Yeah. But, it, but it didn't. Okay. It didn't. I know. That's why I'm surprised. But it was why... stupid clock management. I know. That's why I'm just surprised it's your focus of the game from last night. I mean, I think it's an important part i i mean i i guess people were watching overtime i mean i you know obviously i didn't want alabama to cover they didn't so it's not like i'm bitter about that i just can't believe they were taking the shots they were taking and not yeah. taking any clock off so uh in terms of winning the sec which i don't know what kind of value you put on that uh from talking to people around alabama i know what kind of value they put on it and it, it is a lot um in terms of winning the sec i said going into that game last night felt like a must And as I was watching that game and Florida continued to answer everything Alabama did, I started thinking this SEC is going to get really, 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 really interesting. Um, I think Alabama, I'm not, I mean, it's it's easy to say now because they won the game. I think they probably had to win that game to win the SEC. Uh, I know you said this yesterday. I I I said it before the game. Again, I think it still comes down to March 2nd when you host Tennessee. Now, the Florida game, At least on paper, this is how difficult their schedule is going down the stretch. I mean, Florida at home or at Ole Miss? And that game got away from Ole Miss last night. What do you mean? The more likely win? No, I'm just saying, what what is the more difficult game in your opinion? Uh, Florida at home. Okay, well, it's going to look like that now that that they were down 10 in overtime. I just think Florida is a worse matchup for Alabama. Ole Miss's defense isn't great. And even playing at Ole Miss, I think Alabama, especially with Reitzel back in the lineup, which he should be by then, I think Alabama is a great matchup at Ole Miss. Yeah, I would just say this. And again, Vegas is not the end-all, be-all. But Alabama went off as a 10-point favorite. There is not a chance in hell. They're more than a four and a half or five point favorite on the road at Ole Miss. Yeah. So I'm just saying, right. by I mean, that Vegas, logic, Vegas was wrong about the Alabama Florida game. So, yeah, by that yeah. logic, though, Ole Miss seems to be the more difficult. I would say the more difficult game. Ole Miss can be playing for their tournament lives yeah. in that game. So I they think are. that'll be the more difficult game at Kentucky, at Ole Miss, Tennessee at home, at Florida. Arkansas is really the only breather you get. Oh, no. They're, everything's a quad one right now. Now, Florida, that's the tricky thing about Florida. After that loss last night, they slipped to 29th in the net. And it's hard to believe that on the road in Gainesville, that would not be a quad one, though. Oh, it will be on the road in Gainesville, but last night's won't be if they drop below 30. That's the problem. That's how, you know, that's the quad game. Well, you look at Florida, what they've got coming up. They've got Vanderbilt and Missouri back-to-back home games. So that's two wins, so they should still be there. Yeah, that's two wins. But uh, Florida right now 29th in the net. So if you're an Alabama fan, you've already lost Indiana State as a uh, quad one win you don't want to lose florida too and uh so you want florida if you're an alabama fan now just to keep winning well, well, you got to play them again you prefer them to lose that one obviously. It, 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 we've talked about how difficult this alabama schedule is down the stretch we've talked about how difficult the auburn schedule is down the stretch i think florida has the easiest in-conference schedule down the stretch that you can imagine They've got Vanderbilt and Missouri back-to-back games at home. Then they go to South Carolina, tough game. Yep. They host Alabama. Then they close out with Vanderbilt on the road. Yeah, that's that's a that's a night for a team that somebody is saying is on the bubble. That's a good bubble schedule right there. Yeah, and I think even at three and two, just beating yeah. the uh, the crap teams that you're supposed to Vanderbilt twice and Missouri once, that gets you to 21 regular season wins in the second deepest conference in college basketball. So they should be squarely in. Yeah, I still think Alabama finishes 14 and four. I think that's good enough to win the conference championship. Little T asked me that on our uh, Instagram or we were asked that on Instagram live on the way home last night I think Alabama splits the Kentucky Ole Miss road trips yeah I can't I can't tell you Kentucky Kentucky good luck figuring them out I think they split that road trip 
Now, if they win at Kentucky, they're going to win the SEC, I think. But I think they split the uh, Kentucky Ole Miss road trips. I think they beat Tennessee at home. I think they probably lose to Florida down there, and then they beat Arkansas. Yeah, that, that gives them 14-4. and four. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, and 14-4 and four before the season. I don't know if you would have said 14-4 and four wins it, but if you would have known the depth of this conference, yeah. then you would have said 14-4 and four does. Yeah, I mean, 16-2 and two won it last year, and 16-2 and two would run away with it this year. That, that's the depth of this conference. So Alabama gets the overtime win last night. A lot of people in the chat room like Troy are saying, I do not understand how that Florida team's on the bubble. How are we going to have that many more I mean, teams? Check in. that for me. I'm looking at bracketology right here, and let's just see where. And, and I did hear it was a uh, ESPN. Yeah. Now, Ole Miss, last four in. That was before last night. Yeah, Lenardi takes forever to update. Sometimes he does an update daily this time of year. Do you year, think which, he's one of those that sleeps in? I don't know, but a lot of times he does does not update daily, which I really do not understand. Uh, yeah, I mean, they've got Florida. He's got Florida trending up as a seven in Charlotte. Right. So even if they drop, you know, a seed last night to an eight, it's squarely in right now. Yeah. Uh, a. Holt says, I love Nate, but he needs to take that jacket back to Goodwill. Um, David says, Florida isn't on the bubble. LOL, seven seed right now. That's about what they look like. I yeah. would say that. Um, I think they look better than a seven seed. I think they look like one of the top 20 teams in college basketball right now. Yeah. You know, which puts them as a five seed, but they're probably not going to get that high. But with that schedule, I mean, if they go 4-1 down the stretch, win a couple of games in Nashville, they could easily move up to a four or five. Mohamed Wagi is likely facing uh, a suspension of one or multiple games by the SEC for elbowing a Florida player Wednesday night. That is according to a source. Um, to Mike Rodak. Now, Waggy's minutes have gone way down. I played three last that was a night. Pretty obvious elbow, though. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> not surprised at all that there will be a suspension here. Yeah, so uh, according to Mike Rodak, uh, that is on the way. Now, again, he is not a heavy contributor to, um, to the Alabama team right now, but he is a body. I mean, they're playing him. Let's see. His last, I know he played three last night. I was just going to go look at his recent games. Um, Six against uh, Texas A&M in a blowout win. Two in the loss at Auburn. 11 minutes against State. Um, you know, obviously State a little bit bigger lineup. Six against Georgia. So it's not, you know, not exactly a starter. But he's a guy that, according to Mike Rodak, is going to be sidelined uh, for a little bit of basketball here. Yeah, I mean, this is still a guy that averages 10 minutes. He's He's a big... He averages 10, but that has dropped a lot recently. It has, but you're still, you know, you're talking about a 6'10 guy, and you just don't really have that kind of presence. Now, I will say. In uh, fact, Lance, he's only had double digit minutes in two conference games, both those against Mississippi State. That's going to tell you a lot about what State brings to the table, right? That's the only time he's had double digit minutes in a conference game. When we had Richard Hendricks on the show on Monday, you know, he was talking about Grant Nelson and, and kind of the difference between him and Dalton Connect. And Nelson is more of a three or four that's playing a five. Um, but Nelson, nice game last night. Uh, Sam Walters, nice game last night. Um, yeah, you know, Sam Estrada, Walters. really good 41 minutes from Estrada last night. Yeah, yeah. I talked to him a little bit after the game. You know, he was on the show the other day, and he was talking about how much he enjoyed the interview that it, we didn't just talk basketball. And I was like, well, you'll learn that as you come on yeah. our show. We're probably not going to do a ton of that with you. Uh, I did think Sam Walters' 18 minutes were the best he's played, the most impactful minutes he's played in Alabama. He, he's a guy that uh, – and I am not just saying this. Grant Nelson said this in the post game. Sam Walters is a guy that came in not a very good defender. And I still don't know that he's a great defender. Like Nate Oates chewed his tail out one time because he didn't get back on a run out. And, uh, but I think he – according to Grant Nelson, he's gotten a lot better and he's a very coachable guy. Hey, they – they better thank God they had him last night. They hit eight of 32 threes. He had four of the eight. Yep. I mean, without him, they lose the game. Oh, no, there's no doubt. And I thought he was that impactful. And this is a guy that was a true freshman. He will he will learn. I mean, again, defense, a lot of it is effort. Yep. Um, you know, he's got the athletic ability where he'll be able to play some defense. He'll get better and better on that end. Yeah. Nate, uh, Nate got on him pretty darn good. Um on that one, uh, it was in the first half as a run out, and he just he just didn't get back, just didn't get back. And like you said, that's that's a lot of effort though. But but when he gets hot shooting, he's a confident shooter. Yeah. You can tell he looks for that shot. You know, and Mark Sears had about I mean, for Mark Sears, about as poor of a game shooting. Well, now, the whole team did really. You know, he was very involved though with the eight assist, and I guess the eight game twenty plus streak is now snapped at seventeen, where he goes five of fifteen and one of six behind the arc. Um, 
But I thought Wrightsell was really missed last night. Again, there's no doubt. None of this matters because Alabama finds a way to get it done. That's how good this Alabama team, especially in Coleman, is. But Reitzel is a guy, when you're 8 of 32 from beyond the arc, and he is the leading three-point shooter in the SEC, there is a correlation there, right? That you're 8 of 32 from beyond the arc. Well, you know, I talked about, you know, Sears, Griffin, Reitzel, these guys at any time can come out, give you four or five threes each. And you mentioned it. Walters was that guy that goes four of seven behind the arc last night. You got so many guys that actually can hit that perimeter shot. And that's going to be, you know – whether Alabama makes it to a Sweet 16 or ultimately gets to Phoenix into a Final Four the first time ever, it's going to come down to these shooters. I don't think there's any doubt about it. 